welcome to Half Mum, Half Baby, the virtual meetup. Today's conversation is all around pregnancy after loss, and I have four brilliant women with me today as part of this conversation. I've written a little bit about all of you, just so that everyone knows who you are. All right, uh, you're already part of the Half Mum, Half Baby family because you're on the podcast. Uh, yeah, you're back again. But yeah, I can't believe that was series two, and we're now recording series seven of the podcast. That was. 2018 wasn't it yeah so three years ago yeah yeah yeah, yeah. pretty much the day I would say right around so this time. It was definitely February March time we did it yeah, yeah absolutely uh, and then since then you've written two books yeah. Ask Me's Name and then yeah. Bumpy Road is published next month yeah welcome to this chat uh we also have um Kajal, uh, Kajal Pankhania, have I said that right? Because no one says my name right. Have I? I've done, I've been practising. So I hope so. <laughs> the worst thing is when people can't say Giovanna. It's just, I answer to anything. But I'd I like do, to I do. I answer to anything. So if you had said something else, I probably would have just gone, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Because it just goes over me now. I know, but I started to feel differently about it. I'm a bit like, no, but people should be able to say people's names. But I always miss that point. You know where you can correct someone, that yeah. little window that you have, I miss it. And then I'm like, oh, it's just too late now. And you see the panic in people's eyes. So you're yeah. just like, let's just chat, actually. I don't care what you want to call me. Let's just get through it. Um, but uh, Kajal uh, raises awareness about stillbirth and the challenges she's faced within pregnancy loss as part of a traditional South Asian family. Uh, we also have Jen Reed, founder of Teddy's Wish, which offers support packages, counselling and retreats for bereaved families uh, and also research into, into SIDS. Um, hello, Jen. Hello. Hi. You OK? Yes, I was going to say, actually, it's SIDS, neonatal death and stillbirth that we provide funding for research. Oh, really? Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, and that's been going since 2014, Teddy's Wish. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we set the charity up in July 2014. So just a couple of months after we lost our first baby boy, Eddie. That is incredible, the work that you do. And I, I've, I've been online and sort of dived in a little bit. And it's, I mean, as we're going to talk, you know, loss can feel so lonely. And so having charities and communities like yours are just so great. Uh, and we also have Vanessa Hay, who writes about the stigma of IVF and loss within BAME communities. Hello, Vanessa. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Do you know what? I feel like of all the conversations that I have, I am more nervous about ones about loss than anything else, because I feel like they really mean, like, not that everything else doesn't mean anything, but it's something that so many of us experience but none of us ever would ever wish to. It's one of those things that we are all fearful of. And mm -hmm. I think, and I guess maybe why this conversation is, is happening today is because we're all fearful of it. But it begins when you're in your first pregnancy, it's something that you think about a little bit, but it's not really something that you think about. Uh, mm -hmm. And then second time round, however your loss has occurred, whether it's through a miscarriage, through stillbirth, through baby loss, or whether your baby's a little bit older, you know what can happen. Mm -hmm. And the innocence of that is taken away. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, so I feel like, um, I feel like there is a, not a way to get this right, but I just want to be able, able to welcome you guys in and to, share your experiences in a way that's comfortable for for you ladies as well and I know that that's what you do so I should just stop talking really because that's what you do so wonderfully um but first off I guess the uh apt thing is that well in America I think they have pregnancy loss awareness month this month um and today is kind of their pinpointed day of the actual pregnancy um loss day uh, and also for us in the UK we're off the back of mother's day which throws up loads of different emotions. Um, you know, I think all of us are so thankful for the children that we have, but it makes you reflect on your mothering journey so far. Um, Elle, how were you feeling yesterday? It was, I have to say, it was the happiest Mother's Day I've ever had since I became a mum. So, I mean, that was one, I chalked up one win yesterday. So that was fantastic. But it was, yeah, I guess... I wrote a post about it the other day, actually, because I think I fully expected, as probably many women do when they lose their first baby and then go on to, to have another living child, 
I kind of expected that it would be a wave of magic wand and I everything was everything was fine now I felt I felt fine but obviously that's never going to be the case because you know I should have two children there and I and I have Olivia and with the, though she was wonderful it's it kind of I guess it magnifies everything that you missed out on before as well so it's I don't know if it will feel like that that intensely forever I'm imagining probably it may soften but yeah it was it was definitely mixed emotions I had a big cry last night and I didn't even know what I was crying about I just yeah, the. <laughs> yeah, because you'd written about it in the week as well. Did you feel like maybe you were gearing yourself towards it and not knowing how you were going to feel and then a flood of emotions of getting through it, maybe? Yeah, I think maybe that was probably it. And I, I think I've said this to you before about um, birthdays, anniversaries, the build up. Thing. I always find the build up much worse than the actual and I think probably most women who've experienced similar would say the same thing you come round to that due date that anniversary that whatever and you get yourself all wound up in the lead up and then it happens and you get through it and you kind of it's like you can finally stop holding your breath and, and breathe out again and yeah I did I felt really thankful that we'd had a lovely day, day happy day but at the same time it's a bit you just kind of let it all come out <laughs> And it's good. I think it's good to let it all out. Yeah, so it just, it's still it. better, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Vanessa, how did you feel yesterday? Oh, uh, that I would say the same as Elle. It was, it, was, it was mixed emotions. And the reason why is because the second baby that we lost was around, it was due around the time of Mother's Day. Mm. Um, so that was quite hard. But on the other hand, I the reason why you're speaking to the right people. So, you know, speaking to what you said earlier on about the, the awkwardness of this, this topic, you're speaking to the right ladies. And the reason why is because I've very much learned through therapy and just through going through grief that there's other ways to look at your experience. And, and for me, it was, I've lost two babies, but I'm holding on to the fact that this is a very different Mother's Day in the fact that I have a son, I have a toddler who I can celebrate and I can enjoy this day. And I needed to bear in mind that there are people still looking at this day and seeing it as I, I want this day, day to be a day that I can celebrate in the future. And for me, that was my moment to kind of behold that and say, look, this, this is a blessing. Mm. And I guess that's what got me through yesterday and something that I did. And I'm, I'm all about vulnerability. I have this little kind of phrase like V is for vulnerability and I'm, I'm all about it. And yesterday I put out a, an IGTV of my journey and it was starting from IVF to now. And essentially it was just, for people to understand that in life, everything's a process. Grief is a process. And so I was hoping that with putting that out there and sharing that on Mother's Day, that would also help me in my emotions, but also help others. And I absolutely loved it. I really enjoyed the day. And I something that I, I noticed that I didn't do much was I spent a, a bit too much time on Instagram. Yeah. And the reason why is because the, the video got so much traction, but part of me was also, you know what? I've, I've longed for these days where I could celebrate Mother's Day. So there was one point in time when I put the phone down mm. and thought, right, time to spend time with Sebastian and my family. But it was a great day. In it is incredible how the conversation has moved forward, even in terms of Mother's Day. And it feels like that day is actually a great day to talk about Absolutely. Other people's situations or process how we have felt on those days and the things and the, and the experiences that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember that ever being the case before. And I don't know whether that's because we've all been through been through something and therefore we look at days in a different way or whether it is just a case of actually we, a lot of us now come to those days with our eyes a little bit more open. I agree. Yeah. Kajal, how was your day yesterday? You know what? Yesterday, I think the overriding emotion for me was gratitude and happiness because the Mother's Day before, I was, I even feel wobbly talking about it and I was completely broken and I was heavily pregnant and all the time I was thinking, am I going to go through the same experience? Am I going to go through the same experience? And so yesterday I did this little photo shoot with the boys. You know, I had my a phone on a little tripod and you know we just had so much fun and when I looked at those photos I thought not lucky I'm fortunate and I'm blessed because I think there's such a difference between the word lucky and fortunate and blessed you know lucky almost insinuates it was handed to you on a silver platter but actually we all of us have gone through such a journey to get 
to a point where we can be happy again. And um, we went to, there's a memorial tree which Berkshire Sands has commissioned in Maidenhead at Raymond Island. And it's a metal tree and it has all that leaves all on the tree with all the different babies with their dates of birth that, you know, that have sadly gone too soon. And for me, I always call, it's not Aurelia's tree, but I call it her tree. And that's when I completely, like Elle, I had such a big cry. I just stood at this tree. And you know, when you get that, that feeling of shock, sorry. It's okay. You know, that feeling of shock, like, God, did I go, was that me? Did I go through that? And I had that moment. And then I looked, you know, I looked at the boys, I looked at Nick and I thought, I looked at Remy and I thought, my God, thank God he's here. You know, because we all know what it's like to lose. We know how precious our children are. And actually what miracles all of our children are. Um, but yeah, the override, I know I'm crying now, but the overriding emotion was definitely, thank God I've got what I've got. Mm. That's really, you saying about lucky, it reminds me of my third, preg well, my third son and um so my fourth pregnancy and and I can remember feeling right until the day he was born am I asking too much am I asking for too much luck yeah that my baby is going to be born and he's I'm going to be able to take him home is that is that that feeling of you know that gratitude but it's that weird feeling I think that for me so three pregnancies later it was still very much there because you know um, what people have gone through you know we've seen I think we're you know through social media we all have these incredible platforms so we can share and I feel like we become richer because we learn from what other people go through we don't necessarily understand it firsthand but there's lessons in there and I just yeah definitely feel richer so I totally get that because you're thinking when almost when's my luck going to run out or is it going to yeah. Completely. Yeah. Jen, how was your day yesterday? Yeah, I've been, I think um, how I, you know, I've had a few Mother's Days. I had my first Mother's Day was with Eddie. He was actually here and that was amazing. And then I, then we had a Mother's Day where I didn't have any children after we lost Eddie. Um, and so I've kind of gone through the, the emotions of having a child on Mother's Day, not having a child on Mother's Day. And then now having Ollie and Chloe on Mother's Day. And I've just got this deep sense of appreciation for what we have. But also this feeling that Eddie should be here. And, and I like to call it happy sad. Because I feel that with Ollie and Chloe, we've been able to experience happiness again and love and joy. And we're so grateful for that. But there will always be someone missing. And... I think all the milestones, all the days like anniversaries, birthdays, Mother's Day, they just, um, they make you acutely aware um, that Eddie's not with us anymore and we should be a family of five and not a family of four. Mm. So, um, so mixed emotions, but an overriding feeling of, of gratitude for having Chloe and, and Ollie with me yesterday and just feeling so grateful that, that, we, have th that we have them. So... It was a it was a lovely day, but um, yeah. To everyone else's point, I think it's just this feeling of, you know, sort of lucky, grateful, but very much happy, sad, and 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 and, and I think with grief, it's feelings can coexist in grief. Yeah, and and it's accepting that that you know, grief is not a linear process. It's very up and down, and it's always with us. We will always have that feeling of that devastating loss of not having our babies with us. And it never goes away. It's always there. And there will be triggers along the way. And I think what I found with grief is that it's, they, you know, there's an expression that says time is a healer. But actually, I think what time does is it just gives you more coping mechanisms. It doesn't mean that the grief ever goes away. It's always with us. And we just learn to manage it. And we have more coping mechanisms over the years. Mm. But yes, overriding feeling yesterday was that we had, you know, we had a really lovely, lovely day. Yeah. That's that's good. <laughs> um, talking about grief, though, because obviously I do think that once you've experienced loss, you, like you say, you are 
constantly going to be grieving to some extent, although that might vary for different people, that grief is always with you. Mm. Um, How did you start the idea, start thinking about the idea of trying to have another child? I mean, it was actually very early on, I think because we had had, I'd had the experience of being a mummy for those, those precious short three months but they were the most amazing three months of of my life and I was just desperate to be a mummy still I really want it wasn't in any way to replace Eddie and I'm always so conscious of saying that you know Eddie was my first baby and and I never wanted to replace him but I just wanted to be a mummy again and so we wanted to get pregnant quite early on and for various reasons it it took I know everyone has um it takes everyone different times to get pregnant. I think some people fall pregnant very quickly. Some people take longer. For us, it did take over a year. And it was a really hard, it was it was a hard journey because every month that I got my period, I, I felt like it exasperated my grief and I was losing Eddie all over again. And so I, so I did want to fall pregnant again, but I was also aware that I needed to grieve Eddie as well. And I was grateful for that time to just grieve Eddie because he was our only child. Um, I had all that time to give him, but I did go for investigations because I wanted to find out if I was able to have another child. And I think the problem with investigations is that you then start finding out things that maybe you would never have been aware of. And so I just thought in my mind, well, if I don't fall pregnant naturally, I'll just have IVF. Um, And then I had a test that said that I had an extremely low egg count um, for my age. It was something like, I think it was 1.8. And they said, if I hadn't have fallen pregnant with Eddie naturally, I would have, you know, be, you know, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been able to to naturally conceive. Um, So you're given all of this information. I've lost Eddie. I've then been told that it's very unlikely that I'll, I'll be able to conceive again. Um, I wasn't a good candidate for IVF. And then, you know, again, it sort of, it felt like, well, it felt like punishment. Um, And so I, yeah, so I I, I then stopped ovulating because of stress. And, and actually it was, um, yeah, it it took a year, I ended up going on um, Clomid and to regulate my, um, to get, to get me ovulated again. And that didn't work. And then actually, eventually, we went on a road trip to America. It was a year after we'd lost Eddie. And actually, I kind of went on this road trip thinking, do you know what? I've almost got to plan my life as if, you know, maybe we won't have children again. Like, maybe that's just what's going to happen. And and can we find, can we have a life that's going to be happy without children? Mm. And, you know, Chris and I started thinking about, well, we'll we'll move countries. Um, We'll just be friendly with people that don't have children. Maybe we'll just be friendly with people who've got grown up children. Mm. Um, And, and actually sort of, that was the first time I actually did relax because I kind of almost accepted that maybe this wasn't my calling. Um, and then we did fall pregnant on that road trip. And it was it was a year after we'd lost Eddie. And um, it was just, yeah, and I, it was probably the most relaxed that I'd been because we were on this road trip where we weren't just Jen and Chris bereaved parents, we were Jen and Chris again. And there was this, you know, we were anonymous, which was lovely. And, you know, so I think, you know, so back to your point, yes, I really wanted to be a mummy again, um, but, in hindsight, I look back at that time and think I was very lucky to have been able to grieve Eddie and give him that year. But that's hindsight. So your instinct is to just go again, like do it now. But actually, what happened gave you that time that I could just really grieve Eddie. Um, so I'm sort of grateful for that time. But at the time, it was very, it was very hard. It was really hard. Kajal, after Aurelia. How were you the same? Were you thinking I, I want to try again, or did you did you feel like you had to give it some time? Yeah, I think Jen hit the nail on the head. I was the word desperation comes to mind. I I was just desperate. You know, I felt like you know, like you you're on this racetrack and suddenly you're pushed off and you're watching the other cars go round and round and you think I should be on there. You know, I should be racing my car. Um, I was pregnant with my sister and I were 
um, pregnant together and a few of my friends were pregnant and I was due, I think my sister was first then me. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have this timeline of where your life's gonna be. You look ahead the minute you see that pregnancy test, you know, you've planned your entire life. And so when we lost her, I just thought I have to be back. I have to be back pregnant again. And um, the midwives obviously advise, you know, wait for two or three periods, let your body recover. You've just given birth. And I just thought, I'm not gonna listen to them. I'm, I'm gonna get pregnant straight away. And it doesn't work like that. You know, your mind wants one thing, your heart wants one thing, but your body will, I think, always do what's right for you at the time. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't feel that way. And so it took, it didn't take me long. So I am I'm so grateful for that. But it took me about three, three months to fall pregnant. But you don't, you see that positive test and you don't feel that joy you felt the first time round, or, you know, pre lost, you don't feel that same joy, you just feel complete and utter panic. And my first thought was, how on earth am I going to get through? First, am I going to make it to nine months? And second, how on earth am I going to get through it emotionally? And where Jen said, in hindsight, actually, she had that year to grieve. I didn't then. And I was pregnant and grieving and it was I think the hardest nine months of my life because you've got two completely different emotions you know you're grieving the loss of one child but you're trying to stay happy and positive knowing that everything we think and feel and do and eat affects the baby mm -hmm. and it was a really conflicting position to be in you know really tough. Vanessa you you miscarried after your first round of IVF. Mm -hmm. um, how long did you wait to go again? Because you didn't have to do the initial bit of the IVF process second time round, did you? I didn't have to. That's correct. So um, just to explain that, I my first cycle of IVF was a fresh cycle to which you go through the whole process of collecting your eggs and then having, I can see Elle nodding to whoever else has kind of engaged with it because it's so familiar. So you collect your eggs and hopefully if you're able to get you know, viable eggs collected, but you then go for the embryo transfer. So the good thing is that um, I um, managed to have, I think, six viable embryos, viable in the fact that they can be frozen for later is what I mean. Six viable and em viable embryos left over after my first cycle. So when I miscarried, I knew that the next cycle would be what you call a frozen embryo transfer. So you skip past collecting your eggs again, you could just transfer. But in terms of how quickly I could do it, that wasn't depending on me. It's kind of the same, um, from a medical point of view, it's the same kind of rule that Jen explains where you have to wait a couple of months because your body has been through a lot. And just to clarify, I, I've, I was kind of unlucky to have the double whammy of experiencing infertility and losing babies at the same time. So I guess there was a desperation of, I was so close to finally achieving nearly mm. being a mother um, but at the same time, I was in no control over, OK, now that miscarriage has happened, let me do it straight away, because that was dependent on the rules and the policies around how IVF worked. And from, from what I remember, it was, I think, you have to have three cycles, three normal cycles after a miscarriage. Annoyingly, I, I came under the category of unexplained infertility, which means they cannot tell you why you cannot get pregnant. But I had irregular cycles, so I thought that could that could be six months, yeah. three normal cycles could be six months of waiting. Um, and I'm, I'm one of those really, really, I wouldn't say tricky patients. I advocate for myself. So I just emailed my consultant saying, look, you know that I have irregular cycles. You know that everything went, thank God, went really, really smoothly. And if I don't get the three cycles that you're looking for, I want to be able to start by April. And it also, wasn't. We all know how stress, like Kajal yeah. said, how that impacts your your precisely cycle, so precisely so so I said I can't guarantee that I'm going to get these cycles but what I do want is I do want to start my next cycle of IVF and when I sent that email I think he was very he was very personable he was very understanding and said okay if you can get two we'll, we'll, we'll have a middle ground here if you can get two cycles then we can we can start you on I, on your second cycle of IVF so I think it was April 2017 that we tried again in the IVF terms and obviously that led to Sebastian, who's my, my three-year-old son now. Yeah. Do you think that because it was part of 
that process? Do you feel like you were still able to grieve or were you able, were, were you focusing on like the cycles, things like that? You know, I, I guess it's a slightly different process in some ways, but in other ways, it's the same in terms of how we feel emotionally, uh, physically and mentally. Yeah, I think in terms of grieving, something that I've always, a mindset that I've, I've always had is, 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 it speaks to what KJ said about, I was, I feel like I was a mother from the, as an IVF patient, I have the privilege of seeing my baby in its embryo form. Yeah. So for me, that's magical. And for me, that's at that point when I see my baby on the screen, in fact, by law, as soon as you have your embryo transfer, you're actually deemed as pregnant. You're protected under pregnancy law. So for me, I was already a mother. And a lot of people, and, and, you know, I, I, I'm sensitive to how everybody wants to kind of deem their pregnancies or, you know, what they what mother, motherhood means to them. But I, I never say I had an unsuccessful cycle. It was a successful cycle, but it resulted in a loss. And for me, that at that point, I became a mother. And I never allowed myself to take that away. So even though I didn't have a living baby that was born nine months later, I became a mother at the point that I had that positive pregnancy test and my HCG levels were rising just that bit slower, but were showing that I was pregnant. And that was, it was that mindset and that kind of thinking that helped me to grieve. What was difficult was the fact that because the journey started with infertility, it was that desperation of just wanting to, have a baby that I could hold in my arms. And so I'm so thankful that it didn't take long to get there because the second cycle was successful. But I do sometimes wonder what grief would have looked like if that was a subsequent cycle that ended up with no baby. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? How those can kind of sort of build into your grief. Um, L, after Teddy, how, because I, I know that you went through secondary infertility. How long after Teddy did you feel ready to to start trying for another baby? I think it wasn't even a feeling of like thinking about it or considering it. And I think Michelle and I talked to you about this previously that we both felt as soon as we lost Teddy and she lost all of it, it was kind of this, and I'm sure Jen's probably just explained it and what she said it it's it's like an instinct it's like it this instinctive thing that you you don't have a baby in your arms and you've just been through this long journey and you've either got there and then it's been taken away or it's been taken away as part of the process of giving but you know and you I think I've described it as this before it's like getting to the door of the nightclub and like getting into the cloakroom and they go to take your coat and you're like yeah I'm in here and then it's like boom out you're not coming in and you but but mentally you were already checked in you were you were in there having a great time and now you're out here and I yeah for me it was kind of like this really visceral feeling like it was I needed to be pregnant again I was going to be pregnant again I was going to have another baby and I, I was quite fortunate, like um, Kajal said, I, I actually fell pregnant um, three, four months after Teddy died and, and very sadly that ended in another loss, but it was a, I had to have a termination for medical reasons and that just added this extra kind of layer of, well, you know, I, I thought I'd already been dished out my bad luck. <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't really think that that could that could happen again and and happen in such a different way and then when that so then when that happened that really was like whoa okay maybe I started having the same thoughts as Jen maybe I'm not meant to have another baby maybe you know this is it and then I ended up in a situation where my cycles didn't come back and as we all know you know we've just touched on it's a catch 22 sometimes the more stressed you get <laughs> the less likely you are to have a period and so on and so forth and you know I found myself kind of slung onto that secondary infertility merry-go-round where suddenly I'm trying every drug under the sun legal to, to try you know to try and get things going get things working and it just became this it just snowballed and it just became this I've that's what I want that is what I want is to be able to do that again 
I feel like we've all touched on something and that is the word desperation. Mm. Yeah. Whether we've actually said it or not, there's definitely been that feeling of almost once you've had that taste of it, you're kind of, you, you, it's like makes it even more. And mm. I feel like, you know, it, it, even in terms of cycles, we all have that thing where people say, just relax. And, and Jen, you're the perfect yeah. example of it. Relax because your mind plays, you know, it, it overtakes everything. But if you just relax, everything will happen. And that is the worst thing you can say to someone because all with that desperation just kind of takes over and that desire and that need, that mm-hmm. maternal instinct, that, um, that feeling of wanting that baby and everything you dreamed of. And whether... You know, for, for, for me, I was pregnant for, for weeks when I miscarried. And, but that carried all of those hopes and dreams I'd carried for years. So they're all piled in to that first experience. And, uh, and for me, there was definitely a feeling of um, that first experience then having an effect on when I next found out that I was pregnant, which Kajal um, said with her as well. Um, Jen, what was it like for you when you found out you were pregnant? Because obviously, elation, I would imagine, because you've done it. Yeah. Is there a feeling of this is what I wanted, but oh my gosh. I think what ha- I remember getting the positive result. So I actually, when we came back from America, I had a test to see if I'd ovulated. And they called me to let me know if I'd ovulated or not. And they left a message and I didn't want to listen to the message. I was terrified of hearing it. Um, And so I didn't listen to the message. And then I didn't get my period. And I went to see the consultant and she was like, how long has it been? I said, you know, it's been something like three weeks. She said, we... She said, I think you've got to do a pregnancy test. Um, and I was, so I did the test and I was pregnant. And it was just, it was a feeling of elation and relief. But then when hope re-enters your life again, there's a fear of loss again. Yeah. So the anxiety kicked in. And, and I know this is very different from having a stillbirth or, or losing a baby um, to having a miscarriage. But I think once you become a statistic or you're on the wrong side of statistics, you think everything's going to work against you. So I did, I fear, I thought I was going to have a stillbirth or I was going to have a miscarriage earlier on. And it didn't matter what anyone said to me. That was how I felt. And it was really, it was a very scary nine months. I was very well supported. I made sure that I had good therapy and we had the most amazing counsellor, which is why I think, you know, for us, it's so important as a charity that we give that support to other parents, especially when they're pregnant after loss, because it, it a new anxiety comes into that. Mm-hmm. And um, and so so I made sure you know we made sure I was well supported. Chris wrapped me up in cotton wool, um, and it was a very very scary night. It was a very scary nine months, but the real anxiety kicked in when Ollie was born, because that you know it didn't matter that the doctor said all oh, the chances of it happening again are so slim you, you just don't believe it and we, we we were really anxious we 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 were very well supported in that we had this you know we had a monitor on ollie and we had a mattress monitor and, and an apnea monitor but chris and i did um we did night shifts we were just up every night watching ollie I mean, I, I still don't think I've slept properly for the last five years um, because you're just, I think as a bereaved parent that's lost a child, especially to Sid, you never go to, to sleep with the safe knowledge that your baby's going to wake up. And that fear, as irrational as it might sound, just doesn't ever go away. And the only way for me to manage it was actually just to try and be present in the moment. Just, I did quite a bit of mindfulness meditation, I tried to say, you know, say to myself, look, if everything is okay in this moment, and whether that was in pregnancy or or beyond, then every then we're okay. And let's not try and kind of think too far ahead. And that's, you know, because then your brain just goes to other places. And it's quite scary. So it was just about bringing myself back to that present moment. And, and just trying to sort of, it's, it's also really hard to have trust in life again. That's the other thing as well. You just think that's it, you know, we're just, we're doomed. Um, And as I said earlier, I was like, you know, but but feelings can coexist. You can feel anxious. You can feel happy. You can feel sad. Like this is just all part of it. Um, But I definitely felt there was this just huge relief and appreciation for being pregnant again. I was actually a bit worried about other people's reactions. I think my friends and family were relieved 
but I didn't want them to think that, okay, well, Jen's now fixed or she's okay now because she's got another baby. You know, she's fine now. And I was very conscious of always saying when Ollie arrived that he's he has shone light and happiness back into our life again, but we will always be missing his older brother, Eddie. And I'm very conscious of that even now. Like, I just don't want Eddie to be forgotten mm. or people to think that we're okay now because it does bring other anxieties when you do get pregnant after loss. How long were you both doing the night shift for? Um, oh gosh, at, least, at least for the first six months, seven, eight months even. I think, it, well, yes, it was yeah, pretty much eight months. And then actually he, sta- he was in our room for the first 18 months. I wouldn't let him go into another room. Um, I only took the monitor off him when he was three and a half. And Chloe is three now. She's got a mattress monitor. And every night I always go to bed and check on them. But it was just that monitor was never, it was never going to prevent it from happening again. But it was giving me the best opportunity if it was going to happen again. It's like a fire alarm. So it gives you a warning that something's happening to see you've got the best possible chance to get there if anything happened. And just that, hearing that ticking noise or just seeing that little flashing light it's just given me such a sense of reassurance and and comfort um, because it is a very, very scary thing to go through. Yeah. So, yeah. Vanessa, I am. Um, so like I, I had a miscarriage early on and um, and for me, and I wonder if it's the same for you, that even though because I think there's this thing of people might think that when you once you get past that part, once you get past that bit, you feel safer. Yeah. Mm. But actually, I don't know whether it's the same for you. I felt like the whole of each of my pregnancies, I was expecting the worst, worst because of that. Every time, even like later on in pregnancy, I, every time I went for a toilet, I went to the toilet. I think it's the wipe and the fear. You know, I think that that is something that most women who have had miscarriage will kind of feel that. Mm. Did you, did you, how, how was your second pregnancy? Second pregnancy was a tricky one because I had been through life being told, well, life since I decided we would, me and my husband decided we wanted kids that we couldn't have them naturally. So to clarify, our second pregnancy was a spontaneous one. So on one hand, the irony is we hate people who say, um, just relax and you'll get pregnant. But we were relaxed and we got pregnant. (laughs) You know, we weren't thinking as soon as Sebastian came, we weren't thinking about it. We're just going through life back at work. You know, things were going well. And I remember um, taking a random pregnancy test to which my midwife friend said, take a pregnancy test. And I said, look, 70 day cycles are normal for me. It's I'm not pregnant. And then I think the second line came up quicker than the control line on the pregnancy test. That's how pregnant I was. So I was already like six weeks gone and I guess you, just, you need to remind me of the question that you had, by the way, because I'm trying to think of why I actually started speaking. <laughs> how, how was that pregnancy? Yeah, I, for me, it was almost like this must it must be meant to be because the fact that we struggled so much to have our first child and this has just happened randomly, naturally, not through any means of trying hard to have it. it mm. It's going to be fine. So I actually went through that pregnancy with, with no calms whatsoever. There was there was that wipe and fear thing. So I, I do feel like every time I approach the toilet, my legs were crossed. Yeah. But apart from that, I was thinking there's no there's no sickness in my, you know, my IVF days. No sickness, no, you know, really, really sore breasts or anything was like, oh, you know, that's ringing alarm bells. I didn't have any of that. In hindsight, it was because it was an ectopic pregnancy. But that didn't matter to me. I thought everything is going to be absolutely fine. It's meant to be. And you, so even at the point when it was a suspected ectopic pregnancy, I was fine. I just, I just had this, this faith that for how this has come about, there is no way that after everything that I've been through, we're going to lose another child. So it, when we lost our second baby, the, the grief, and it just hit me like a ton of grip bricks because it was the last thing that I expected to hear was, we're really, really sorry, really, really sorry, but you, you could die if, you, if we don't terminate this pregnancy will take you into theatre so I had there wasn't there was nothing I was fine there was no fear in my second pregnancy at all I I just felt like it was my I can't remember which which the lady said it but for me it was almost like this can't be after everything we've been through there is no way that this is going to be another 
bad luck moment. This has to be our moment of good things. Mm. And I guess it wasn't. Elle, that's something that you talk about uh, in your book, that feeling of surely that is your time to have a rainbow. Surely it's your time to have a bit of luck. And I feel like, I guess because I know you the most, there was definitely this feeling of um, because you had shared your story and you shared your experience with Teddy, that feeling of everyone wanting you to have a rainbow, everyone wanting you to have that bit of luck, that bit of joy, that those good cards to be on your table. And I feel like that in itself is lovely, but that is also hard to carry. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, when you know people are rooting for you and, and I guess I had been so open and honest with our, our journey. And whenever we went through something else, whether that be another round of treatment or another loss, I probably wouldn't write about it right at the time, but I would write about it retrospectively normally a couple of months down the line so I'd say okay guys this is the next installment you know like I, it, because it got to that point where I was just like this is actually it's funny but it's not funny you know it's catch I can't catch a break here the universe is is playing some sort of weird cruel joke on me and and you know every time it, it would happen and I would write about it and I would get all these messages from people lovely beautiful wonderful messages from people being so hopeful and saying you know we, I feel like I want this for you so much and at the same time that carries this kind of pressure because all it, when you know the goings on of what you've just had to go through in IVF as Vanessa will tell you to get to that point where you even got to an embryo transfer or you know you've, you've had a, a miscarriage you you know all the workings behind the scene of, of what's gone on and you're thinking okay this might not happen this might not happen and then I'm letting everyone down <laughs> I don't know that's such a it sounds crazy when you say it out, out loud but it yeah it is kind of unsurmountable pressure I guess that that everybody wants it for you and that's lovely and wonderful but what if it doesn't happen oh and it's twofold because everyone wants it for you but also people are looking at you for hope within their own stories and their own experience so if you see it happen to someone else you're kind of a bit like well that can happen for me because it happened for Al. she's got her rainbow and now you know it is that thing you just you you I think you say in your book Al, that the the newest one about seeking out those stories seeking out those positive experiences yeah. that have come after out of IVF or whatever whatever you know just trying to absorb them and trying to almost taking a bit of their luck if we want to use luck you know or at least a bit of their hope yeah and it's natural human reaction isn't it we we seek out those people those other unlucky ones I guess so we can go oh it happened for her and and this isn't the end for me you know so I think um sorry the dog's trying to get into the room Horace Horace is trying to get into the room but not only that he has a plastic cone on his head because he's hurt his eyes so he's bashing the door I've told my mum to keep him down there but I don't know <laughs> sorry where was I but yeah I think you know we tune into that and and it's actually been lovely for me since you know I have gone through pregnancy after loss which was extremely anxiety ridden and now I'm through it to the other side which has its own anxieties, but um, the number of people who write to me and say, I'm so glad I've just found your blog and, and I've just read everything from start to finish to where you are now. I mean, that's four and a bit years of me writing and pouring everything onto that. And, and then they tell me what, you know, they email me and they tell me what's, what they've been going through and that actually reading that has made them feel better. It's made them feel less alone and it's made them think that, you know, one day, some somehow, that could happen for them as well. And I think no matter how that happens, that's why in the book, the, the new book, I wanted to include other women's journeys of, you know, Vanessa's written a beautiful piece for me, for, of which I am eternally thankful. Um, but how that happens for everyone, uh, whether that be adoption, surrogacy, it doesn't have to 
to be how we have it written in our heads. It can happen so many other ways now. And I think that's the hope that women can hold on to. Yeah. Kajal, what was your pregnancy like? Because obviously you had to get beyond where you lost Aurelia, you know, and, and I imagine that whereas mine was early on, you had that bit leading up to it, which must have felt like forever. Oh, it really did. I can only describe it as I felt like I was on the edge of a cliff with my eyes shut every single day. And I thought at any moment, I'm just, I'm going to go. And I literally stayed on that edge until I had him. And I, I think I went a bit crazy. I was, you know, you Google absolutely everything, every twitch, you know, twitching your little toe. What does this mean in early pregnancy? You know, that was me, I was all over it. And, it. and it makes things 10 times worse. And I would always say to someone else, don't Google, but it is the first thing I did, you know, throughout my pregnancy with Remy. Um, and I was, I think when, after I lost Aurelia, I forged some really strong relationships with different people in the hospital. I don't know how, it was very organic. Um, I just clicked with just various people. And I remember ringing the bereavement midwife. I had her number in my phone and I was early on in pregnancy. And I just said, Claire, I'm gonna lose the baby. I'm gonna lose the baby. I really need a scan. And I think she just thought, we better get her a scan before, you know, she goes completely crazy. But I think I was, I was just so sure it was all going to go wrong. And so um, they really took care of me. And that's what got me through it. I was having scans every single week. And I remember it was about week nine and the consultant um, I was seeing, he was actually the consultant that told me that Aurelia had died. Um, but he was so gentle and lovely that it was comforting to see him again in, in my third pregnancy. Um, and I remember his nurse, you know, as she was writing up the notes, she said, oh, great, everything's looking brilliant. I'll, I'll get her discharged from the early pregnancy unit. And he looked at me, he went and he laughed. He went, oh, she's not going to let that happen. She said, we <laughs> put it down for next week. And I did see him every week till about 16 weeks. And then he said to me, we really need to wean you off these scans. He said, you're doing really well. He was so encouraging. He said, let's go to every two weeks and then we'll try and move monthly. Um, and he was seeing me as a favor, I, you know, cause I, I don't think you can go consultant led and I think from 20 weeks onwards. So he got me to that 20 week mark, weaning me off very, very gently. Um, and honestly, I lived for those appointments because pregnancy becomes a pro, well, it became a process for me after loss, just something I had to get through. And I just went from appointment to appointment. That's all I could do. I didn't take photos. I couldn't bring myself to get attached to this pregnancy. Um, and it really was great. I've made it through another appointment, right? Counting down the days to my next one. Um, and then when I did go, you know, officially consultant led at 20 weeks, he was just amazing. And he, when I was with him for one appointment, he said, ah, we're coming up to the point that you lost Aurelia. And I didn't, I didn't say anything to him. And I said, yeah. And he went, right, what are you doing next Thursday? And I said, oh, I don't know. What am I doing next Thursday? He said, you come into hospital, you're going to meet me here. Nobody knows. I'm just going to see you for an extra scan. And it was a Saturday. And I think in that sort of seven to 10 days, he scanned me about three or four times in that period. Um, and that is honestly what just got me through. And I, I, I cried at the start of every single scan because we were in a pandemic. I was on my own. And then I cried with complete and utter relief, like, you know, you're kind of looking with one eye at the screen. You want to look and you don't want to look at exactly the same time. And as soon as he, the first thing he'd say was, everything's fine. You can, you can start breathing again now. Um, and yeah. And yeah, they were, they were incredible. And I know I was very fortunate to have that level of care. Um, and anytime I needed to see the midwife, I'd just pick up the phone. Can you squeeze me in? And and she always would, you know, even just for a quick listen to the heartbeat. But that, that's what got me through. Mm. Jen, what was it like meeting Ollie? 
Oh, gosh. Ollie, well, so with Ollie, I didn't know if we were going to have a boy or a girl. So <clears throat> with Eddie, we found out that we were having a boy. And I just felt with this pregnancy, I wanted to do everything opposite to what I did. Um, I think it was just sort of, again, irrational um, feelings about it. But it was just, yeah, I mean, just completely elated, relieved, um, terrified, um, just all of those emotions just kind of all come flooding out. And just this... Um, just yeah just this it's just innate feeling of happiness which I just hadn't felt for you know for, for sort of two years and um yeah so just a feeling of joy that I never thought that I would ever be able to feel again and I think that's the thing about Luke when you lose a baby and you're in the depths of those of, of, of grief you just don't ever you can't fathom a future without your baby and then you can't even see a future where you're happy again and so and when you do feel it, you just, you inha- I mean, I inhaled him. It was just those, you know, you, you hold on to every single second and you don't want to moan or complain. That's the other thing. You just, I, I, just, I just didn't want to complain about anything. Um, you know, sleepless nights didn't care about, um, you know, anything that happened. I was just, I was just so grateful. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was just, yeah, the most, the most beautiful feeling in the world. I think once you've experienced loss and then you experience happiness again I think that ex- you, you 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 experience it on a complete in a different level that I would ever have experienced it before mm. I think that's thing because you've had such different extremities of emotion that you just have this deep appreciation for it that you've never felt before um which is yeah so it was just it was amazing it was just am- amazing absolutely amazing we touched on earlier that idea um that the grief stays. It's not like a new baby arrives and they replace the baby that came before. Mm-hmm. And that idea that grief and happiness almost coexist mm-hmm. when there's a pregnancy after loss, when you have a baby in that way. Is that something that you've all experienced? Yeah, very much so. Definitely. Yeah. It was actually explained to me really well. I think I wrote about it in my um, blog for Al. Uh, a midwife described it to me as a tennis grief starts like a tennis ball in a jam jar and it's you know completely engulfs this jam jar there is no space for anything else to move around and over time although the tennis ball stays exactly the same size the jam jar evolves into a vase and so the, this ball of grief it can move around and you know the the space in the vase allows for other things to enter your life, happiness, sadness, you know, because that is life. And things can start to move together. And But the grief, I think that the the thing I took from that, that it doesn't diminish, you know, you don't suddenly have another baby and all your grief gets smaller and smaller, not at all. Your grief does stay exactly the same size, but life allows for it to move differently as the years go on. Hmm. How about the people around you in terms of family and friends? Has it, do you feel, although I guess people close to you are close to you and they are there for you in a supportive role, but have you ever felt like because you have your long fall baby now that that is a plaster over it and therefore life goes on, life carries on? And, you know, have you ever felt in that way that now that you, now that you have your baby, you're in a happy place. And actually we all know that it's far more complex, but have you ever felt like people want you to move on and park it in a way? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I think uh, certainly in the, the South Asian community, there's think big things like this are not spoken about, you know, okay, I've lost a baby. Well, you just have another one and and you just keep going. That's just the way it is. You you brush everything under the carpet. And I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And I think I really struggled. I don't know if any of you ladies felt the same that when people didn't acknowledge her and I, I found that really hard. I think I gave, I gave birth to, I, I kind of wanted to say, well, I gave birth to her. I, I have at the time I had two children I had Vera and Aurelia um so yeah that was was definitely a struggle from that perspective I think my friends were definitely a lot more understanding I don't know if it's because they were 
they were younger and you know different generation and I do think that makes a difference I think the elder generation especially for me coming from a traditional background um it was another dimension to deal with in trying to educate that that generation and it was tough because you're grieving pregnant trying to explain to people what it's like to go through this and you know break down that stigma um so yeah, for me, it was a mixed bag, definitely more support from friends. Um, and then the traditional members of my family, it was it was tougher, but my immediate family were absolutely, absolutely incredible. And I think I, yeah, very lucky. I guess it's like what we were saying at the top, it is a conversation that people wish they didn't have to have. Mm. Like Elle, I can still remember our first ever chat about Teddy and you and you saying to me, um, it's when I first asked you on the podcast and you saying to me about when you say to someone your child has died the conversation stops whereas when you say to someone I've lost a grandparent they're like oh I'm so sorry the conversation continues you know it's it's that stopper and um, we I think are becoming more and more aware we're becoming better at talking about things that make us uncomfortable we know that being uncomfortable actually that's fine. It, we have to sit in that discomfort sometimes in order to be able to help ourselves and help other people. Um, because the chances are, we all know, we're five women who have who have experienced loss. The chances of people that we know going through something similar, anyone watching this going through something similar, are high. You know that they they are they are likely to happen to to someone somewhere. We know that, and I think the more that these conversations are out there, the better. Yeah, definitely. And I think it will help the um, the kind of language around it to change as well, because going back to what you said about people thinking that you're fixed, um, you know, I, I've lost count of the amount of people who've said to me, I'm so pleased you've got a happy ending. And I'm like, it's, it's a new it's a new part it's a really happy part like like Jen has just said you know you you feel those feelings because you have felt the lowest you've ever felt mm. I feel like when you then feel happy again you feel it to some new extreme it's like insane the amount of happiness that you get from this this tiny person and and it's wonderful but it's not a happy ending you know it doesn't the, the birth of, of another child a subsequent child does not erase the death of another it's not like a you know, oh, I broke that, I'll get a new one. It's, you know, it's kind of, it's so much bigger and deeper than that. So I think the kind of language around how we begin to approach it, now we've opened this subject up and as women and men, we're all talking about it. Now we can have these conversations, we can learn to sit with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The next part is thinking about the language that we then navigate around those conversations. You know, this, this past week, so many people have said to me, enjoy your first Mother's Day. It's not my first Mother's Day. It's, mm. It will be my first happy Mother's Day, but mm. it will not be my first Mother's Day. My first Mother's Day, as far as I'm concerned, was when I was 28 weeks pregnant with Teddy. And every one after that got significantly worse and harder. And and now I have a different a new part and a new a new story to tell so yeah it's I think we can I think we can go further with the language that we start to and as um Kajal was just saying it's a it's an education isn't it it's an education I think our generation are probably a lot we're a lot better at it we're a lot more open and goodness knows how much better the generations below us now they seem to be able to have amazing open conversations but it's you know we just all need to do it don't we yeah Vanessa, you're finding that a lot, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So every, all of the ladies have, have made some really, really good points. And I think something that I, I want to mention, and I haven't always been open about it, is that I, after my second loss, and I, I don't call my losses pregnancy losses, I call them baby losses, because mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to the, the gestation of the child. But after my second baby loss, I, I actually chose to bury my baby. So, and I'll, I'll explain why, I'll, I'll try and make it as succinct as possible, but the, the reason why, um, one of the things that, I, that happens when I explain to people that I had to bury my baby is because actually there is, a, there is a, a policy around what you call the sensitive disposal around 
well, the language that's used in the name of language is products of conception. Mm-hmm. But for what it is, the sense of disposal of, of babies. And, and at the point that I lost our second baby, I was just shy of nine weeks. So I'm getting ready to go to theatre and there's a lot going on in my mind. But I have a registrar next to me saying we, we need to rush you in because you, you're losing your life, but we need, to let, we need to let you know these are your options. Do you want a communal, crema- communal cremation? Do you want to, or do you want to bury your own child? And my husband and I are Christians. So the first thing that we thought was, okay, what, what just seemed natural to us was, okay, let's, let's choose burial, but we'll, we'll, we'll go back to this later on. Anyway, so I, my father-in-law is a, is a, is a bishop, he's a pastor. So we, there's a, there's a guy, a lovely guy that we deal with a lot for all of the funerals that happen in our, our churches. And he's been, He's owned his his company for over 40 years. And he said, I was the very first person that that he learnt. I was the first person that had ever dealt with him that said, what are the arrangements, the funeral arrangements to pick up a a nine-week-old fetus from the hospital? Now, the reason why I decided to bury our baby is because the world has a way of making you decide that once you've lost this baby so early, it doesn't exist. Mm. the question that the comment I'd always get after was when I said I buried my child was oh how far gone were you and I'm I'm a challenger so I'd always say what makes you ask that do you have to be buried at a certain point so does burial only is a burial only deemed you know natural if your if your baby is x amount of weeks old the reason why I actually chose to bury our baby at eight weeks is because I knew that at least I could always go to a place where our child was remembered and that's the reason why I chose to, to bury our baby in a, in, in a garden, because I knew that if it happened to be a communal, a communal cremation or anything other than that, that was it. As soon as I leave that hospital ward to the world, that's the end. That's where I should stop talking about the baby. And that's the reason why I love the concept of what Elle does and everybody here does. There's a legacy. We talk about legacies, what Kajal's doing and Jen is doing and Elle is doing. The concept of everything that we do is about legacy. It's about the fact that regardless of what the world says about losing babies, the most we can do for ourselves and for our mental health is not contradict our emotions, but ensure that there is a way that you can commemorate that baby that could have been. And that's the reason why I chose to bury our baby. And, and I did get the comments that every every lady here has, has you know, even my own mum was like, well, Vanessa, you know, don't worry, at least you've got Sebastian. And I was like, yeah, great, but that it's an end there. This is, this is, I'm not trying to encourage pronatalism that as soon as you become the mother or as soon as you have a living child, you've ticked the box. You know, it doesn't end there. Like, the, the, there's more in my community because we're, we're very pronatal, is about having children and having big families. There is a lot of education that needs to happen around actually when you lose a child just because you're not fully broken, it doesn't mean you can't grieve. And so that was also a learning lesson for my community as well, that I buried my eight week old fetus because that is also something that I'd like to remember that was very much a part of our lives. Just as what Elle said, that wasn't my first, my first Mother's Day wasn't three years ago when Sebastian was born. It was at the point that I lost, we lost our first IVF baby. That was, that was the first time the the Mother's Day that came after that. And the same for this. I I remember I had, um, I'm not sure if you you ladies get it, but I had a lady who um, sent me a DM on Instagram and she said, how do you how do you do what you do and have three children and have um, three children? And I was like, I cope because one of those children are living and two of them are angel babies. But immediately she saw my bio and thought because I'd had pictures of three babies in there that they were living babies. So you have you have to have these awkward conversations, but it educates to allow people to start changing their language and how they perceive what you deem as a baby or a living child or whatever it is. And, and that's really helped me through the grief and keeping that legacy in my own mind for my own mental health. And it's really interesting that you and Kajal, you're both finding that within your communities and, and, and people that you, you know, socialise with and everything, it's, it's that thing that we don't talk about that. You know, it's that, you know, let's just carry on moving forward. And actually, we all need to be talking. Everyone needs to be talking about this because... I remember saying it to you, Al, when you're on the podcast, not talking about it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Mm. It happens. And we need to educate ourselves on those conversations and how we talk about them, how we grieve, what we do. I think sometimes a lot of how people behave has got to do with them. Yeah. 
rather than us. There was a there was a journalist that wrote a brilliant piece about grief and something that she learned is that uncomfortable conversations is sometimes isn't about what you're going through or how you've chosen to deal with something. It's a lot about how other people feel. They they want to do their best. They want you to be OK. So f- for that reason, obviously, they can say and do the most unreasonable or really insensitive stuff. But sometimes it's about that person other than yourself. So what I always try and do when it comes to dealing with family members who are in their generations, it's almost frowned upon to talk about pregnancy, let alone anything else that comes after it. It's that open conversation. You know, I've only recently told my mum that we we buried our baby in 2019, December 2019. I only just told my 63 year old mum that we buried that baby because she would have thought what she would have probably taken me to get checked in to a hospital because she she just wouldn't have, <laughs> oh, you laugh, but honestly, she just would not have understood. In in fact, in our culture, we, we don't believe in burying your children. So, a casual, um, is it the shame in South Asian communities? Yeah, so it's very similar. So in our culture, they say that for a child um, sort of up to the age of five, actually they say you should bury them, that that's the right thing to do. Mm. My quote, you know, whenever I'm faced with that, oh, our culture says you've got to do this. I'm like, why? What's the science behind it? Tell me. And there's very rarely an explanation at all, let alone one that kind of marries up with what you're being asked to do. Um, and I, I just felt unable to bury her. I just, I kept, this is going to sound mad, but I thought I'm just going to go there in the middle of the night and I'm going to dig her up because I know she's there and I'm going to want to hold her. And I did, couldn't put it past myself to actually do that. So I just thought, no, I've, I've got to cremate her. Um, and actually, I was, I was very fully supported by the whole family on that. Whether they were thinking something else and thinking, <laughs> you know, a bit unhinged at the moment, we better not say anything. I'm sure lots of our family thought oh, it wasn't the proper thing to do. But actually nobody nobody said anything to me but yeah I think such similarities and experiences that Vanessa you and I have gone through from a cultural perspective. How do you include the babies that are no longer with us in your family lives? So for us we um we talk about it's weird actually because we're just talking talking about Vanessa about legacy like for us when we set Teddy's wish up it was a really good way to be able to talk about Eddie um, in a meaningful way and it allowed us to move forward and grieve at the same time but also it provided weirdly a language for other people that didn't feel comfortable talking about baby loss so as soon as I said I'd lost Eddie to SIDS and they get you know they didn't know what to say I'd then say but we set up a charity and we're doing you know we're doing and I think it made them feel more relaxed because they were like okay well they're doing something positive and and it kind of allowed us to have a a conversation about it where they didn't feel uncomfortable so just sort of going on that point on legacy and talk and and just talking about baby loss um and then I think for our family we well they I mean we talk about Eddie a lot and we also have um I mean we haven't because of COVID the last year but on our on Eddie's anniversary we do have a family get together where we have like a, a, a memorial lunch we we had a tree that we planted in our garden. Um, It's a magnolia that, that, that blossoms around the time of of when Eddie died. And it's a beautiful white magnolia. And at the last Memorial lunch, we had stones where everyone wrote a note and then we put it under the tree. So I think everyone has their ways of, of honoring their babies and, and remembering, you know, remembering Eddie in, in, in the anniversaries, I think, is really important for our family and and I and as I said through Teddy's wish we get to talk about him a lot anyway so it's almost part of the daily conversation and and the kids are now getting us an eight you know they're now I mean Ollie's now five and he's becoming more aware of Eddie from the photographs I mean he doesn't really understand that he had a brother here because he came after Eddie but he said something really profound to me a while ago he said to me mummy when you and daddy lost Eddie and you couldn't find him me and Chloe saved you and I just thought it was such a lovely thing to say so he's and he's 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 aware of it. it's not his grief because he never knew Eddie but he 
but he's he likes talking about it and he'll, he'll you know he'll point out to photographs and he'll show people he'll say that's my brother but I think it's sort of a bit abstract to him yeah but I think it's it, for us it is really important that the kids are aware that Eddie was here and he and they had an older brother so we keep it very much you know a part of our yeah Eddie's very much a part of our daily life Elle what about you I guess the, the same as Jen really I Olivia's still so small so I mean she doesn't know what the hell's going on <laughs> <laughs> She, I really hope that when, you know, she gets older and she's old enough to kind of understand that we will just be able to talk to her about her older brother in the most natural way that we can. Because, you know, we always talk about him really normally at home. That sounds silly to even have to say that. I talk about it really normally. But, you know, I would say without hesitating or when I was pregnant with Teddy or when I had Teddy or when when Teddy died, I would just say it. I don't go... <gasps> And not, you know, it's not like I can't get the words out. Now I'm very well practiced at it this many years down the line. But I really hope that that kind of that openness and that honesty will be able to continue around Olivia because I don't want her to think that it's this big scary, oh thing that we can't talk about because it isn't. And actually, you know, I want her to to sort of know and and know what happened and I'm sure when she's older she might want to read one of my books so maybe she'll figure out how she came into the world as well she's going to know way too much that kid but she's you know I think that's it. as Vanessa said it's, it's that legacy isn't it and I think you're I was talking to another bereaved mum recently um and she's a, a mindfulness and bereavement midwife as well and she said to me that she'd learned a lot about uh, Buddhist culture recently and then how um, they view uh, loss and most specifically child loss and um, their belief around it is that as parents when when we lose a baby any gestation as Vanessa's already said that baby lives as part of us we are that baby's continuum so in anything that we do however we live with our with our living children that baby is always part of our energy and everything that we do. So even if we're not shouting about it from the rooftops that day, just by living and existing every day, that that baby is is living with us. And I really love that idea. I think it's such a lovely idea because I think there's a lot of, in the sort of lost community online, I get a lot of mums contact me and say, oh, you know, I really want to do something. I feel like I need to do something, start a charity, start for you don't have to write a blog or start a charity or be shouting things from the rooftop to honor your baby just by getting up each day and carrying on living your life and learning to let that happiness as Cardinal said like back into that vase that is your baby's legacy that you're continuing that and you're continuing to live mm. Vanessa I get for you having somewhere to go where you're baby is as well that must be a huge part of you being able to like you said go somewhere and know that that is part of who you are and that's something that I think with all of us with our losses those losses have they are they've injected us they are part of the mums that we are now we wouldn't be the mums we are without them absolutely and I think something else I didn't get to the stage where I would have known what sex it was to then give it a name and everything else my due date probably would have as all most due dates are probably would have been a bit off so I had to go by the due date that would have calculated in babycenter.co.uk but otherwise those that's enough for me to, to to you know go to the grave on mother's day or the baby's due date and then also again because you have little things like well I'm not ashamed to say this because I, I sanitize it, but keeping the pregnancy test, the positive pregnancy test and your first early pregnancy unit scan, mm-hmm. you can set up memory boxes. If this is if this is if that's what you want to do, I'm not sure if Kajal was able to do with all the scans that she had. I'm kind of jealous, by the way, but <laughs> no, whatever, whatever you whatever you have or whatever appointments that you get. The video that I pop on Instagram, you would you'd have seen that I would have captured on my phone unapologetically, you know, I had a midwife who had like a fetal Doppler. So I used to get... Uh, What's to- a fetal Doppler? I felt like the a fetal Doppler is basically other. like a handheld Doppler machine that allows you to hear the baby's heartbeat. Okay, I've never heard that word it's- said out loud, a fetal Doppler. Am I, am I right? Is that is that what it is? It's a handheld... 
well, I might be the only one that knows it, but yes. So she would come in, and honestly, that the sound of the baby's heartbeat is so scary. It's like a, it sounds like a horse galloping. Right. The point I'm making is, I can go back to that archive of videos, and all of that is an archive of memories for me. So yeah. even though I didn't get to the stage that, unfortunately, some of the ladies obviously were to, to have those kind of memories, that's that's enough for me. And also, we were saving after I lost a tube from the ectopic pregnancy. We were told that it's probably going to be harder even harder so we started saving for our embryo storage and they said we needed to uh, me and my husband needed to pay for a like a, a small kind of headstone that has your baby's name anyway we couldn't afford it but last um mother's day we actually decided to visit the grave and we know where our baby was and all of a sudden we, we saw a we saw a headstone that said baby hey born sleeping so i don't know if there was like a goodwill gesture but someone had paid for our baby's headstone so we can yeah I know that's crazy I, it, it was it was such a magical <laughs> moment my eyes all the time but it doesn't take much you know <laughs> you can't you can't make these stories up but we literally went there and I was like I just I said where is it again but I always know because they have it in order of when the babies were born sleeping I, I know the baby that was around the time that 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 baby died and I know the name so I saw that name and then all of a sudden I saw baby Hay sleeping. I was like, someone's paid for our, our stone. And, and that's nice. Yeah. It just, it just feels yeah. more real. Sorry. Sorry. I'm asking questions now. You asked the question. You how, asked did that, the question. how did that feel when you saw that? I just, I just thought, you know what? There are kind people in this world and there are people that understand. Because I think, so, I, I think it might be someone in the office that probably said, let's just organize it for them. Because when when you go and see the funeral, like even even with those, that gestation, you still have to speak to the funeral directors, and they say it's you know the baby's plot is in this area in the, in, in the communal garden, it's in C B area and whatever it is. So we would have been talking to her about our journey. So I I think someone just sorted us out. But the point of the matter is, there are kind people in this world. Like yeah. there's a, there's, a, there's a film that I really love. It's called Little Miracles Are Everywhere, and even in in grief, you, you've got to look at those signs. The people that do make that journey, that be easy. And, and that was a full circle moment for me. Like there are really kind people and I cried, of course. Um, but after I just sat taking, of course, like me, I just sat taking selfies with the, <laughs> with the baby. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. It's so good that someone would do that. Yeah, absolutely. Cardi, what about Aurelia and your family? So oh, I, I had Bire to think about and when we found out he, he was with us because we'd been um, we'd been having lunch it was bank holiday in May we'd been having lunch with our family and you know it was three o'clock and I couldn't believe the whole day had gone and I just thought oh my god I haven't felt I haven't felt any movement you know you have in that moment you don't think about anything else you just know you have to get to the hospital so he was with us he was only four at the time um and we when we were in the room and you know how midwives make small talk and they try to reassure you that everything's going to be okay and they use the the doppler the handheld doppler and you know nothing and they're like oh maybe you know maybe this one's not working I'm just going to go and get the senior midwife and obviously at that point you you just know you don't go and get a senior member of staff for no reason obviously they did it again and by this point I'm literally like just so twitchy knowing I've got to control my emotions because my my little boy's in the room and as a mother we I can't remember who talked about it it's that instinct isn't it whether your child is there or not however you're parenting um that instinct kicks in and you know you have to put that child before yourself and then obviously when they scanned me and said you know I'm so there's dreaded words we nobody ever wants to hear but you know I'm so sorry there's no heartbeat I just thought how on earth you know that thought did enter my head of how on earth do I explain to him he's been so excited about this pregnancy we didn't know if we were having a boy or girl and he always used to say to me mummy you've got my girl in there you've got my girl in there always used to say it to me um and 
when we got home, like as we were driving home, I remember we stopped to get him a McDonald's because I thought, my God, he's not eating anything and got home. I remember going for a shower and thinking, I need to tell, I need to be honest with him first. I, I want him to be the first person to know. And I just, I didn't think, I just thought I'm just going to be honest. And I remember getting him ready in his pajamas in his room and I sat on his bed and I just, and I, I, again, I haven't given it any thoughts. So I wasn't prepped. I didn't know what was going to come out of my mouth. I was just kind of hoping for the best. And I just said, um, Vire, and at that point, actually, I didn't know if it was a girl. That was a bit later on. And I said, Vire, um, and I just used the words, the baby has died, because I thought there's no point in using t- language that he's not going to understand or that he's going to find confusing. And I remember Nick saying to me, I hate the word died and dead. I don't like that language. And I said, but he's a four year old boy. That's all he's going to understand. And he said, and I said, um, she's going to go and be with God. And he went, well, how is she going to get there? And I, oh, how's the baby going to get there? And I said, I thought, oh my God, what do I say? And I said, oh, well, God's, God's going to come down and get the baby. Well, how's God going to get here? And I thought, oh, bloody hell, you know, I'm not prepared for this at all. And I said, and then he said to me, is he going to come on an aeroplane? And I said, yeah, he is. He's going to come on an aeroplane and she's going to, um, the baby's going to go with him. And, you know, the baby's going to be so happy there. And then at the time in our old house, we had all his books on top of his cupboard. And I always used to say, oh, mummy can't lift you. So you tell me what book you want and I'll get it down. And he said to me, oh, you can lift me today, can't you? Because our baby's died. And, you know, it's moments like that, that you just, you, you die in that moment. Because not only have I felt in that moment, I thought, I haven't just lost my baby. I've lost, I've lost his sibling. And I've lost my husband's child. And you're not just dealing with your own grief because your loved ones are grieving. You're dealing with everyone's grief. And I think as women of the house, we naturally take on so much anyway. It's just in our blood, isn't it? And I felt guilt, you know, I felt complete and utter guilt. I thought I failed him. You know, I was so excited to see them play together and watch these two children form a relationship and I thought he's he's not going to have that now but I feel I do feel like I've done the right thing in in being so honest with him and you know he makes he has made her such a natural part of our life it like somebody might ask him a question and he'll just say Oh, and Aurelia, like Nick said something the other day, like, oh, I love my boys, Vire and Remy. And he was like, Daddy, what about what about Aurelia? You know, he'll correct, he'll correct someone if they don't include her. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's always writing her letters and messages. And if we've got, he loves balloons. So he'll be like, Mommy, can we give this balloon to Aurelia? And he gives it to me like I'm the go-between between the two of them. And he well, you can you can get it on the I plane. <laughs> Yeah, such an such an innocent, pure love. Um and I think that's helped me with my strength and it's helped me along my journey. You know, I've had no choice, but I had to keep getting up for him. I had to wake up the next day, put one foot in front of the other and be okay for him. And I always wonder what would I have done if I didn't have him? How would how would I have coped? Um and I'm sure I would have, but perhaps my journey would have been very different without him. I would say he's, he saved me. He, he definitely saved me. I know that we could talk for hours and hours and hours, um, but I think to, to round everything up, talking about pregnancy and loss and someone who's going through it, and we all know that it's such a complex thing to go through. What advice would you either give yourself when you were going through it or someone else who is going through it now what advice would you give having gone through it very recently in the middle of a pandemic (laughs) unexpected uh, circumstances I like you know I always say to you I hate giving advice I don't want to give advice because yeah we're do it as if it's to I you. Always, I always write to myself. I love I love doing it. I know you love doing that as well. Um, 
ask for help and vocalize how you're feeling because pregnancy after loss is just so intense and it is some of those thoughts and feelings spinning around your head that you are think you think you're the only person that's thinking and feeling like that I guarantee you if you vocalize that and you say it out loud nothing is too crazy and you you need to tell those nearest and dearest to you because they are your support network they are the people who are going to help carry you through that experience but also tell the care team who are looking after you whether that be your obstetrician your midwife your mental health midwife mine all got it every time I went in to see them I was uh, it all just came out how I was thinking how I was feeling and I was really lucky I was looked after by an incredible obstetrician who had been with us all the way through our care from when Teddy died to lifting our daughter into the world it was insane the, like she deserves a plethora of different medals for what she's <laughs> done um but yeah just vocalize it don't be afraid because I think the fear that you're already holding on to in that pregnancy it becomes a fear of then saying that out loud as well in case people think you're not grateful people think that you know you for whatever reason you know they might think not think less of you but I think that's a worry that if you say it out loud then people might think oh you know is she okay but yeah just ask for help ask for help and say everything that you're thinking and feeling out right loud because I guarantee you nothing is too crazy trust me I've thought of all of it <laughs> <laughs> Jen what advice would you give? I just yeah I think gosh I think Elle, you, you always speak so beautifully and articulately about it. And I think just to echo what Elle's saying is that don't be afraid to, to ask for help, but also don't be afraid to ask the, um, the medical professionals that, you know, no, no, no question is going to sound too stupid. If you want to have an extra scan for reassurance, then, then do it. Don't be afraid to ask them that you need that for reassurance, because I think, um, I think that's that's really important. And I think also to to get, you know, professional support. I think, you know, you can't underestimate the the importance of having professional support, not just from friends and family, but there's there's some ama there's amazing counsellors and bereavement support out there. Um, and so don't be afraid to look for that because that's there for you, too. And um, and and and, I, and don't be afraid to say to people, yes, I'm I've got this amazing news and I'm pregnant again, but that doesn't take away the pain of losing my baby and so don't be afraid to say that either and, and I guess it's that thing again isn't it the more that is said the more it breaks down that dialogue yeah that other conversation that kind of feels that it seems like it will fix things getting pregnant again it kind of opens things up but actually there's it's a bit more complex than that yeah because we can't that's the other thing is that we can't expect people to be mind readers unless people who have experienced it vocalize those thoughts that other way, that other stuff just continues to flow through, you know, generation after generation. Um, Vanessa, what advice or le what advice would you give other people or what letter would you write to yourself? I've written a lot of letters to myself in my journal. I've got three of them now. So um, I'll really put that to the side. But I think it's what Jen, I, I, one thing that I take away that I hear from my therapist and other people that I'd like to echo what Jen said is the fact that joy and pain can coexist. And so I, I say that because we're, if we're talking about pregnancy and loss, you shouldn't feel guilty if there is a joy and a happiness and elation about, wow, we're here again. But then also a memory or also maybe a nervousness around what could happen with this one. You know, my, my therapist, in, in, in other words, says the same thing about joy and pain coexisting, but she says you can't contradict your emotions. You've got to sit in the moment of what you're sitting in and whether that's a combination of pay, pain and, and, and joy or sadness or whatever it is to on the spectrum. Our emotions don't sit on a spectrum and that's why you can't contradict them. So whatever you're going through, whether whatever emotions you're going through in that circumstance, let them be and sit in that moment because that ultimately puts you in a better place to deal with them in preparation for that baby that is to come or babies. Because I know ba people who get double rainbows sometimes. So yes, that's my advice. Casual. For me, I would say allow yourself to have hope. 
And even if it starts as this tiny little shred of hope, which I think quite often it, it does, allow yourself to cling on to it. Even if that hope doesn't grow, hold on to that tiny little piece because you are allowed to feel hopeful. You know, you are allowed to believe in your future. And I really started to believe in that, manifesting those positive thoughts. And that ultimately what's meant for you in life is going to come for you in life. But there is no harm in really, really, and take time out, actually set aside set aside time in your day and just visualize what you want your future to look like visualize that baby visualize yourself as a family and just believe it's going to happen love that thank you so much like I said I feel like we could keep talking and talking and talking but I'm very aware that we actually all do have other responsibilities (laughs) and lives so sorry I mean, Boris is still trying to get in the door with his cone in his head. So. Nathan, do you know, I had to dash off. I've just delivered him back down to my poor mum. I mean, she, <laughs> she's probably watched about 15 episodes of the Baby Club now, G. So she's <laughs> she's clapping her hands and wiggling her toes with the best of them down there. Oh, bless her. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Honestly, uh-huh. I don't have to tell you, you ladies, that every time this is talks about, you know, that you're helping someone, um, you know, and, and I just think let's ca- let's keep that those conversations happening because we know that they help. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. So thank much. you for having us. Huge thanks to Disney Plus for helping us bring you the happy mum happy baby virtual meetup and if you like this then there are so many more videos for you to watch and enjoy just head to happymumhappybaby.com to find out more enjoy